Hello, everybody in Facebook land. <laughs> it's Cindy and our prayer group here in Monroe, Louisiana. And we are back. We are studying session 14, part three. And we can't get enough of God and the Song of Solomon. I wish you were here with us. If you're local, please stop by and join us sometime because the worship is always wonderful. His presence is strong and after we do the teaching and we pray for each other and he usually flows, God comes in prophetic prayer and healings and whatever we need. I mean, I recently just had a serious miracle in my life. You know, I had the CT CAT scan and they couldn't find anything wrong with me and I was hurting so bad just the week before. But everybody here at prayer group prayed for me and my lower abdomen and we didn't know what it was. We didn't know if it was like you know, cancer. I was like kind of freaking out because I had been through months of testing. They couldn't find anything. So the pain left and I, I kind of felt bad about going to get the CT scan because I didn't have any pain anymore. And then when I went there, you know, I thought, well, I'll have proof that I have no pain, <laughs> at least if nothing else, you know, that there's nothing wrong with me. They made me drink that nasty swill. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but I got absolute proof that there is nothing wrong inside my lower abdomen, my kidneys, my bladder, my pelvic, my female organs, my everything. I'm healed, praise God. I know. It's a big deal when you're scared, you know, and you think, oh gosh, the devil's putting something on me. But God is good. So stop by if you can. And uh, God does great miracles. Uh, I'm sure that Joseph will post on his page if he hasn't already. Joseph Brooks, some of the miracles that happened in his life. And many people who are touched by the Lord every day. So keep up. I always say, if the people on Facebook are bothering you, it's because you need better friends. <laughs> because my Facebook page is like a prayer list every day. And these people out here, I love you guys. You are wonderful. So, welcome from France, welcome from Germany, welcome from China, wherever you're coming from, maybe South Africa. We love you. We love you here in Louisiana. Let it, what, is it, what do we say? Let the bon temps roule. Let the good times begin. <laughs> so, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Even though it's raining out here, Lord, I'm standing on your word that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will raise up a standard against him. And today we have joy, Lord. We're snuggled up in a wonderful home with comfortable couches and a fireplace and your word and each other. And what more could we want? So we bless you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Now, remember, I started the first, what, 13 lessons of the Song of Solomon and I read from the message. Well, now I've got a new one. I love my new Bibles. This is the Passion Translation. And if you haven't read it, it's a lot of fun. We love the Passion Translation. It's, it's not yet complete. They have just the New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon. Jesus like, the first one was for me. So here we go. I'm going to read where we are right now. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And this is the Bridegroom King speaking. <clears throat> oh, my beloved, you are lovely. When I see you in your beauty, I see a radiant city where we will dwell as one. More pleasing than any pleasure, more delightful than any delight, you have ravished my heart, stealing away my strength and to resist you. Even host of angels stand in awe of you. Turn your eyes from me. I can't take it anymore. I can't resist the passion of these eyes that I adore, overpowered by a glance and my ravished heart undone. Held captive by your love, I am truly overcome. For your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice. Oh, that translation. It's not a paraphrase. This is a translation from the Hebrew and the Greek. And it is glorious. Now, as you know, my favorite is the New King James, and this little sweetie has been with me since 1984. It's actually the year it came out, and as you can see, it's my Bible. I know everybody laughs, but I'm telling you, as God is my witness, He made this for me. Because I went to, at that time, my husband's grandmother, 
and I asked her how to shop for a Bible. I mean, I was green. I was what they call a greenhorn. I'd been raised in the church my whole life. I had Bibles, but I wanted, you know, a study Bible. I was hungry for the Word. And she said, well, make a list of all the things you want. You know, I thought, well, what kind of things are there? <laughs> I want the Bible. <laughs> I want red letters. That's all I knew. <laughs> I wanted the red letter part. I like Jesus in red. So I, she taught me, and I made a list, and there was no Bible. None. There was no Bible. They had my wish list. And I'm like, oh, God, now what? So she said, well, this new one came out. You know, I got a copy. You want to look through it? It's right here in my room. And it had everything on my wish list. And this is it. This is the New King James Open Bible. And you can just change the title to Cindy's Bible. I'll allow share. I'll share. Okay. <laughs> this is what I always teach from and have forever. It just speaks to me. So here we go. We're at the third part of session 14, and we're at the same place, but I'm going to read it in here as well. I know this probably will sound more familiar to you. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tirza, as lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Isn't that beautiful? You know, God is very poetic. He is not only mathematical and the creator of the universe, but he is poetic, prophetic. He, he is all the personalities wrapped up into one. He is a glorious God and no place more than the Song of Solomon. And why do we study this so much? Well, number one, I want you to understand that the Song of Solomon is the very transcript of God's heart. Can you believe that? It's the transcript. Transcript means, for those of you who don't remember, the writing down like a play. Mm -hmm. Word for word, he said this, she said this. When you're in a court of law and they transcribe it, they literally type the minutes exactly, okay, the judge said this, the witness said this. It's a transcript. This is a transcript of the heart of God. And it shows you how he feels very few places in Scripture show you how He feels about us. It tells us that we're made in His image. It tells us, you know, how Jesus felt when Lazarus died and He wept. But this whole book is about God's heart towards His bride. It's something that most people just think is something you read at the wedding ceremony, you know. It's a beautiful love poetry, but it is so much more, so much more. And if you haven't caught up with us to now, please, please do go back and listen to the other teachings because we're right here in the middle of the book and we've gone past the elementary principles. And we're now right to where she's mature and she, in like chapter four, now we're in chapter six, okay? There's eight chapters. So we're in the mature teachings of the song. So if you're finding yourself a little lost, it's okay. Just go back to the beginning and start at the beginning where we all do. So here we are. He says, oh my love. That in itself is enough for me. <laughs> it's enough for me to hear God say, Oh, my love. You know, in chapter 5, she's going through the hardest testing of her life. And here we're in chapter 6. Well, Jesus has not spoken all this time. He's been silent. She's been alone. She's been beaten by the people in the church. She's been kicked out. She's been accused. She's been slandered and accused of horrible things. Horrible things have happened to her. Her faith is all she has. Her faith and her love of God. People are continually persecuting her. I know that many of us have gone through times like this. I was just reading last night in my journal. This one, I got a trunk full of these. A wise friend of mine who's with the Lord even now told me to start writing and dating and journaling everything. And this is from 1999 even. And it was the year that... Um, my husband and I were fired. Uh, he was an Episcopal priest, and we were fired. And um, I was hurting a lot. Uh, didn't understand what was going on. And naturally, being a prophet and an apostle of the Lord, a lot of the flack came towards me. But as God is my witness, all I ever did was put Jesus first. <laughs> was just love the Lord first, you know. The first and greatest commandment is what? 
to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you really do that, you become a thorn in the flesh of those who don't. It's just part of it. Even your family, you know, they get jealous of your time. And you want more time with the Lord. You want to worship Him. You want to read His Word. You, and then this zeal consumes you to be used by Him because He fills you so full. If you don't have an outlet for it, you'll burn, slam up. He's a consuming fire. And those who don't walk in that place with God do not understand like um, Jeremiah says, the zeal of the Lord consumes me. It literally is a burning in you that causes you and compels you and then shoots you out. And you have no other desires but that. And, and yet you're in the world, but not of it. And you're constantly trying to navigate this balance of this fire of God within you and this fiery love for the lost and you want to help everybody you can and and your family just doesn't understand sometimes and, and your your friends don't understand and and you want to fit in you know and you try to go to the movies with people and hang out and and you're just like man this was fun but said Roth's coming on or, you know <laughs> some TV show that's about Jesus or I gotta get back and read that book I was reading it's just you have, you're a changed person you have no control over who you are. You are born again. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you can try to go back, but you can't. You can't. The only way to go back is like a dog returning to its vomit. You go back into sin, you are more miserable than you were in the first place. And that's a grace of God. God forbid that He would ever quit trying to convict us of sin. But in the middle of my horrible seasons of life, you know, the Lord's here. I, I'm here, my beloved. Come, let me comfort you in your sorrow tonight. I long for you as well, my sweet. My desire is for you too, my precious darling bride-to-be. Let me wipe away all your tears and all your fears. And, and it's just, it's every page, you know. And I go back and I'm, I'm so grateful because in the midst of those deep, dark, painful moments of a city rejecting you, not just a little prayer group, not just a friend or a family or a husband. A whole city coming against you at once and blackballing you. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, there's only one way through that. You abide under the terebinth tree. And I'm going to let you figure that one out with Jesus. <laughs> so here we are. <clears throat> oh, my love. Jesus answers the bride. He suddenly breaks the silence. After this horrible season, he goes, Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tirza. Well, I don't know about you, but the first time I read that, I'm like, Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Who the heck is Tirza? Well, Tirza's not a woman. It's a place. Tirza is a place in Israel. It is actually the capital city of the northern kingdom. So it was one of the most beautiful, attractive cities in the ancient world. I believe it was in Lebanon, which unfortunately today is rubble. But it was the vacation center of Israel. We're going to Tirza on the Mediterranean Ocean and we'll have a beautiful vacation. So he's describing her. And uh, in this difficult season, he's saying, you know, it's over. It's over, my love. You've passed the season. You are as beautiful as Tirza. Um, tears are becoming like the carnal beauty or the natural beauty. Um, <clears throat> the city, the word Tirza actually means beautiful. So he's saying you are as beautiful as beautiful. <laughs> the city was named, like I said, because it was such a gorgeous paradise of a place, a natural beauty. And one of the beautiful things that he says to her when he reassures her of his great love is he's saying, I see the yes in your heart. If you've been with us in chapters before, that is the most beautiful thing to the Lord. It's not the victory in your life which He brings. It's the yes in your heart in the midst of it all. Yes, I will go through this with you, Lord. Yes, I will be victorious with you. Yes, I will rise up from the love bed. I will go to the mountains of myrrh. I will go my way to the way of the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense in intercession and in spiritual warfare. I won't just stay in my little room secret, but I will go out with you for you are a safe Savior, Lord. I trust you is what he's saying. You have trust for me in your heart. 
And it is so beautiful to him. And then he says, you are as lovely as Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is a special place to the Lord. It always has been, and I believe it always will be. But it represents the spiritual beauty. Tirzah, the natural, and Jerusalem, the spiritual. Because Jerusalem was the capital city of Israel, and it was the national center of worship. It is the national center of the worship of Israel. Now, we really don't think of it that way much today, but it is. It's the center of the world's worship, and it yet will return that way one day. It is the place of Solomon's temple. It is the place of the temple sacrifices. It's the place where the Shekinah glory came down. The Chavod of God and a weighty presence of God came down and all the priests and everyone fell on their faces before the Lord in the glory of the Lord. That is what he's saying of her. You are as beautiful as the spiritual center of worship to my heart. You are as I in my glory coming down to the earth. That's what he says of us. The most beautiful carnal and natural beauty and the most beautiful spiritual and worshiping beauty. <clears throat> he says to her, you are awesome as an army with banners. Now, <clears throat> an army with banners. Okay, now this is not, as I've said before, is not just an army. She's not just a warrior. She's an army with banners. That means you're victorious. When you come back in at the end of the war and you're waving your banner, that shows victory. I am victorious. And he says she's like an army with banner. She's victorious in him. Now remember, she doesn't feel anything. She's been neglected and wounded. And the fact that she's worshiping him is what he says over her. He sees her as victorious. <clears throat> he sees her as having victory over her fear, over her doubts, over her unbelief. He calls her this because she's gained victory, inner personal victory over the challenges in her life, over the test, the twofold test of God that we talked about. One time she was disobedient and he withdrew his presence. The second time she was obedient and he withdrew his presence. And she is now victorious over both. I think that the Holy Spirit has poured out such a loyal love in her heart for Jesus. A loyal love. I love that phrase. She's now loyal to him at all costs. At all costs. Because he knows that she's lost it all. So she's proven her love to him because she's already lost it all and she still loves him in the midst of it. You're not, you're not going to be able to just use your lips to tell God I'll do that. Mm. You have to have walked through it to prove it to him. A lover that's forsaken all for another lover doesn't take lip service as the proof of their love. You know, a lot of people say they love you, a lot of people say they like you, but it's what they do that matters. It's not what they say. What they do is who they really are. And remember that when you're dealing with toxic people, uh, especially a narcissist and people that are users. It's what they do that you judge their fruit not what they tell you they're like and not what they tell you they do and please remember to protect yourself from this and the best way to do it is to pull back pull back if you argue with them that's their love they love to argue to prove how horrible you are and how right they were so just let me encourage you to understand that when you're dealing with toxic people, you're not dealing with Christians who are sold out for the Lord, and you, you do this in a different way. And what God has shown us in her life is she's learned how to overcome the little foxes that steal the grapes. She's learned how to be an overcomer of the toxic people that have wounded her out of their own selfishness. You know, Proverbs Proverbs is full of wonderful advice about conquering the sinful passions of your heart. Let's look at just a couple of them. For those of you who struggle with sinful passions of any kind or getting your flesh in con under control, Proverbs was made for you. And each verse is full. I mean, you can just open it up and read any one of them. Um, <clears throat> chapter 2. Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. 
Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Um, there's just every chapter. I mean, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. You know, in chapter 4, Proverbs is a wonderful book for getting rid of those sinful passions in your own heart. As you meditate in that, I'll just throw that in for you. Because you struggle and you're defeated really by the enemies of your own soul, not by those around you. You may feel like that you're defeated by those who reject you by those who hate you, by those who say mean things to you, or those who fire you from your jobs, but you're not. You're defeated by your own sinful passions, by not trusting God in the midst of your persecution. What did Jesus say? It wasn't the food you ate that defiled you. He said, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That is what defiles us. He says to us, with the same measure you use, it is measured unto you. These are the deeper lessons of God. <clears throat> you know, I want to point this out. <clears throat> this is the only time in all of eternity, not just history on the earth, all of eternity, that we can ravish the heart of God. You know, do we want to ravish His heart? Do we want to have Him say, oh, you have overcome me. With one glance, I'm overcome, I'm overdone by you. We want to ravish the heart of God. We want Him to be so in love with us. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? Do we win more lost souls? Well, He likes that because He loves other people. But what He really loves is so simple. He loves faith and trust in Him personally. That's what He loves more than anything. He loves that more than victory. You see... Now, angels can see everything, right? They already know him for who he is. The four elders, the living elders around the throne, the four living creatures, they already see him in all his glory. We, on the earth, on the other hand, see through a glass darkly. We see just a little bit. We're the only ones required to have faith, human beings on the earth. Humans that have already gone to heaven don't need faith anymore because it's all revealed. All that was done and seen will all be revealed okay but now in the earth is the only time that we need faith remember that because we're gonna already know when we get there it's gonna be glorious but now is the only time that we can ravish his heart in the unseen realm of our faith let's look at a couple of scriptures i want to get into this a little bit more let's look at exodus 32 10 all right this is moses I love Moses. Did you know we were talking about humility this week and meekness? And did you know that Moses is said of Moses that he was the meekest man that had ever lived? Well, I don't know about you, but that's not my impression of Moses. <laughs> you know, I think of Charlton Heston parting the Red Sea with his big robe and his white beard. But the scripture says he was the meekest man that ever lived. And I think that what that means is he knew his God. He knew who he was in God, and he knew his God could move through him. It wasn't about Moses' power. It was about God through him. So let's look in uh, 32.10. Moses says to the Lord, okay, first of all, in chapter 32, verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Okay, he's on the mountain and the Lord is saying, Get down there. They're making a golden calf. Look, oh, I'm just gone for a minute. And look what you people got into. Okay. And in verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. You know, I'm stubborn, prideful. Now, therefore, leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. He's like, I'm going to wipe them out and I'll start over with you. Well, he did that with Noah already and he's like, I'm fed up. I'm going to do it again. You know, I don't know how, but God was at the end of his rope. And Moses started praying in verse 11. He pleaded with the Lord. He pleaded with the Lord and the Lord relented to do harm to his people. And then in verse 33, this beautiful part. The Lord says, um, 
Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. He says, and Moses replies, I will not go up in your midst uh, without you, Lord. Let's see, where does he say that? Basically, it's the whole chapter. But basically what God is saying to Moses is, go up, go up. And he says, Lord, unless you go, I'm not going. The Lord was more important to him than being a leader of people. Can you say that of yourself? What are we desiring? Now, this week we've been through a lot. We had a deliverance session last week. And a whole lot of us have been fighting that Jezebel and Leviathan spirit trying to come back into our lives and our region. It's been poking at us. And we've overcome. We've overcome through prayer. But didn't mean the battle wasn't real. But one of the things God's really put on my heart is our selfishness. Our selfishness in prayer. Our selfishness in church. It's even our selfishness when we come to get prophecy. Why are we coming? We want a word for ourselves. We want God to speak to us. We want direction for us. We want blessings for us. And we've got to switch our focus from I am my beloved and, and uh, he is mine to I am my beloved and his desire is for me. That my focus is not self-focused, but it's God-focused. It's what God wants. It's like the kingdom of God come through me. And there's a lot, they say dying to self. But what you're really doing is you're putting yourself second to the Lord. You're putting the first commandment first. To love the Lord thy God. To worship him first. With all my heart, with all my soul, mind and strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. That is a very unpopular, unpopular scripture. And now let me point it out. In practice, if you're helping others, you're a wonderful, kind person. You go do ministry to the poor, you're lovely. You go give money to lots of people, oh, you're great. You're going to get some pats on the back. Look what a giving person they are. But if you pull away to be alone with the Lord and skip going to church, what kind of person do they perceive you as? See, we've got this topsy-turvy world, you know. It's, um, it's the enemy strategy against us that people call what is good bad and what is evil good. That is the enemy strategy. We've got to remember that God sees things from a different point of view. Don't say, I don't say going to church is wrong. No, we should absolutely be in a fellowship of believers. But why are you going? Why are you going? Now, that pastor on the platform is exhausted from dealing with all our problems all week because we're like babies. Feed me, feed me, feed me. I hurt, I hurt, I hurt. She hurt my feelings. He said, she said. And then we expect that man or woman to get the anointing of God and to get the anointed message and come up on the stage every week and pour it out upon us like he's God himself. And did anybody go to him and say, how are you doing? Do you see the system itself is sick? We're, we're actually forced into being babies to sit in the congregation, to never be allowed to share what God's put in us. Whereas he's so exhausted, he needs to sit down and have somebody else minister, but he's the one who's hired to do it. The system is sick. And I propose to you that God is doing something new. He's doing a new thing. This is not necessarily it, but he's doing a new thing in the future where he's bringing us back to communities who have real relationship. And boy, is it hard. Real relationships are hard. You've got to forgive each other. You've got to do the hard work of the kingdom of God. You don't just show up and smile and leave on Sunday or Wednesday. You've literally got to do the forgiveness, the giving, the the growing, the, you know, and you've got to worship together daily, not just twice a week. Living in community is hard, but God is pouring out a grace, a grace upon us. Because this is important to Him, to mature us, so that when the last days are upon us, and all its fullness and the tribulation comes, we're ready. Do you think the babies that sit every Sunday and go, feed me, feed me, feed me, are ready to be the persecuted church? I don't think so. Do you know what the persecuted church of today tells us? The two most important things to be ready for fire, for, the, for them to be arrested and thrown in jail and tortured from China. They've told me personally, these are the two most important things to do. Number one, memorize your Bible because they will take it from you. And you get everyone in your group to take one chapter and memorize it. And they're responsible to keep that chapter memorized. And then you can write it down and you handwrite copies and you pass it around. 
That is number one. Number two, they say you must know the people in your fellowship like you know yourself. You must trust them because the occults will infiltrate for two or three years in your group and then they will start dividing and they will sneak you away and they will arrest you and some of them are kidnapped and, and beat and tortured some are you know infiltration from the government and they're arrested know your people like the back of your hand so if my life was in danger faith i would trust you with my life that's how close we need to be to overcome persecution. If someone told me that Ashton was out in a bar sinning, sleeping with people, I would say, not my Ashton. No way. That's a lie from hell. Because we know each other. We walk in the purity of the holiness of God together. That and your safety with the Lord because you are really one. That's what keeps us safe in the last days. So we need to mature. We need to grow up in God. And how do we do that is in the secret place. It's not what you think. It's not having all a library full of books. It's having God say to you, turn your eyes away from me for you have overcome me. It's understanding who he is that we become transformed. Beholding Him, we become transformed from strength to strength and glory to glory. He is totally overcome by weak and broken people who love Him in the midst of their trials. I'm going to say this again because this is the key to ravishing God's heart. Totally overcome by weak and broken people who love Him in the midst of their trials. You know... I imagine all of us hurting, houses flooded, bank accounts empty, roommates yelling at us, and we're here, and we're just in this little room, and we're worshiping the Lord, and we choose to put Him first, and we say, God, we know we've got these troubles, but we trust You. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, He just peels back the heavenlies, and He says, Stop everything! Look! Look! Look right there! Look at that! Oh my God, oh, that group of people. Oh, of heaven, look, look, they've ravished my heart with their faith. <gasps> look, they're glancing up at me with just one glance. I'm undone. That's the heart of the Lord, a weak and broken people. He created the oceans. Do they overcome him? Nope. Do the stars and the immenseness of their beauty overwhelm the heart of the Lord? No. Do principalities and powers cause the living God to tremble as big as those devils are? No. No one conquers the living God. Do the, the angels around His throne continually, do that, does that overwhelm Him? Have you ever heard of anything in the book of Revelation where it says He looked over at Him one time? Mm-mm. They're just doing it. There in all of Him, He's sitting completely still. The elders are falling down on their face, throwing crowns at Him continually. People are crying out, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb! And He doesn't move. But one glance from you overwhelms the living God. Overwhelms Him to the point of death on the cross. One simple glance in his direction. You know, this not seen dimension that we live in, this temporal place. Let's look at it. Second Corinthians. I want you to see that what I'm saying is scriptural. And it's always good to back it up for all those religious people that might be watching. <laughs> we love you with the love of the Lord we love you daughters of Jerusalem and it's our love sickness that will cause you to be ravished by the Lord yourself as you learn to grow in him 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 well I love 17 so let me just say that too <laughs> for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are seen are, et are not seen are eternal. We live in a world 
which I like to call <laughs> this glorious insanity. You know, I I'm call myself a mystic because there just really isn't a definition in a modern age of what I am. I asked the Lord one time and he said, well, you're a Pentecostal sacramentalist. I'm like, what the heck is that, Lord? You know, I love the gifts and the flowing of the Holy Spirit, but I also like the liturgy and the symbolism. You know, I, I love to go to the Catholic Church. I go over there on Christmas Eve all the time, and I hoop it up with them. It's wonderful. And I love to go to the Pentecostal Church. If you love Jesus, I love you. You know, let's just keep this simple. Do we have to argue over every little jot and tittle all the time? So I just say, Lord, help me, Lord. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get back. So John 20, 29. Look at what he says about the unseen. John 20, 29. And I love this because John 20, 20 says, you know, 20, 20 vision. He says, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. It's like a little joke in here. 20, 20 vision, they saw the Lord. <laughs> okay, but John 20, 29 says, um, Okay, this is for all the doubters, all right? Thomas, the doubter, you remember? And they were eight days, they were inside, and they were shut up after Jesus was crucified. And and he said to Thomas, when he uh, just walked through the wall, wouldn't you love it? Oh, God, just walk through our wall right now and appear to us, Lord. Oh, we would love that. He says, reach your finger in here and look at my hand. You know, stick your finger right in the wound. I'm real, Thomas. You know, I'm alive. He said, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You're precious to the Lord. You are very precious to God in your not seeing, in your not feeling, in your weakness, in your brokenness. And that's not the same sinfulness, okay? Yes, we can be weak and broken in our sinfulness if we come back to the Lord in repentance and we're struggling, but we keep constantly coming back. We're practicing righteousness because John tells us if we say we don't sin, we're liars. We are. We all sin. Every day a little thought comes into my head about, look, oh, I better not say that out loud. You know, <laughs> we all struggle with things. And... um I'm not going to put on tape what I struggle with this week, but you know, we do. So <laughs> the beautiful part is this not seen dimension that only we experience in the earth is reserved for his church. It's, re it's like it's a gift. It's reserved for the church on the earth. Not the angels, not the apostles, because, you know, the disciples, they walked with him. They saw him face to face. But we can ravish his heart of people who press in, Though we cannot see, we are the ones that ravish his heart. Nobody conquers the unconquerable God. No one, nothing conquers the unconquerable God but your love, but your glance, your trust, your faith in him, and especially when you're not seeing it or feeling it. You conquered the unconquerable God. That, I can't even really process that. To conquer the unconquerable God. Why would he even put such power in our hands? Why would he do that? I mean, you know, we, oh my gosh, Jesus, you could have just made us puppets. You know, angels don't have free will. Well, maybe he already had puppets. He calls them angels. They don't have free will. We have free will because love is not real unless it's sacrificed. He said, greater love has no man then you lay down your life for a friend. Jesus had the greatest love for he laid down his life for you, his friends. And he didn't just lay it down. He rose from the dead. Woo! He rose from the dead. Don't forget that. Jesus rose from the dead. We are captured. We have captured the heart of God. Well, I'm going to end with that today. I know it's a little shorter than usual, but I just wanted it to sink in. I didn't want to overwhelm you with too much because the unconquerable God is conquered by your weak and broken prayers. Remember, stand in faith. Stand in love. A contrite and a humble heart he will not turn away. And realize that this is the only time in life that we can actually lavish this faith and trust on him. This is it. This is our moment. We can't do it when we get to heaven. This is it. This is our season. So revel in it.
and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love you from Louisiana. Love Jesus first. Bye.